I'm just going to introduce Mason. We're going to talk a little bit about Mason's journey, his story. And um, as always, you are the most important people on this chat. Please, questions, we welcome them. Mason will be very happy to answer whatever comes to mind. Because today we're talking about moving, but it's going to be moving in a way that works for you. But also it's a sharing of an inspirational story. So Mason Cox is an American-Australian professional, Australian rules footballer. We're going to get in how that happened. Um, who plays for the Collingwood Football Club in the Australian Football League. He's a former college basketballer, amazing, who also has an engineering degree. So we love engineers in this house. I'm married to an engineer. Engineers, you know, very helpful in life, I feel. Mason relocated to Australia in 2014 when he was scouted by the AFL. Oh, we're going to talk about this. He made his AFL debut in, on Anzac Day in 2016 and has played over 100 games so far for the Collingwood Football Club. Outside of football, in 2022, Mason launched his very own podcast, The Mason Cox Show. And he is also a regular contributor to, uh, on, is it Kiss FM? K-I-I- Kiss FM with Jason Lauren. Yep, that's it. Okay. Mason also became an Australian citizen in 2022. Congratulations. So, I mean, okay, Mason, my, my mind is racing. So how does <laughs> uh, a boy from Texas end up playing Aussie rules in Australia? Uh, it's a long story. Uh, it's it's a wild roller coaster of events to land me in Melbourne, Australia. Like whenever someone first told me, um, you know, do you want to come to Melbourne? I, I didn't know where that was. So it's been a big change to say the least. But um, yeah, I, I played, as you mentioned, I went to university. So I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and then went to university at Oklahoma State and studied mechanical engineering. And I played soccer growing up my whole life. Um, I had never touched a basketball really, and I'm, I'm six foot eleven. I know you can't probably tell through online, but I'm six foot eleven, which is quite taller, two hundred twelve centimeters, I think it is. Um, so almost seven feet tall, and um, I, I had this massive growth spurt in one summer. I grew six inches, and it was in my senior year, my last year of high school, and I essentially came to the realization I probably took, I probably should have played basketball let's be honest like <laughs> that's just like your god-given talent is tall you can't teach tall so um but I was playing soccer at the time and then um I loved science and math and engineering both my parents were engineers and I went down that path I went to uh, Oklahoma State University studied mechanical engineering and then about two three years into it I was playing basketball for fun and the uh the basketball team there kind of said oh you're freakishly tall like do you you know you interested in maybe coming helping us out so uh, was fortunate enough to get them to to call me up and ask me to, to help, and we took private jets around the country to you know, fly to different games. And it's well, it's a wild scenario in America. Like there's just so much money involved. It's in, insane to me to think about. But we took private jets all over the place um, just to go to games, and then played there for two and a half years. And um, after that, was playing in national tournaments that were televised throughout the U.S. And was fortunate enough that a, a scout from the IFL essentially was like, hey, you've played soccer and you've played basketball and those transfer really well to, to AFL. Would you be interested to come to a combine in Los Angeles? And um, that's kind of where it all started. So did well at that combine. They asked me if I wanted to go to Melbourne. At this point, I already had a job at a, uh, a big oil and gas firm uh, or company down in Dallas or in Houston. So I'd already accepted a job there and then went and tried this out and then essentially threw that job away. <laughs> <laughs> to go play a sport I'd never heard of in a place I'd never been uh, with no family or friends in town. So it was a insane life transition, you could say. And um, yeah, I've been here for essentially 10 years now, which is uh, a crazy thing and a dual citizen of the world here and, you know, somewhat settled over here in Australia, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's extraordinary. And it's extraordinary. Obviously, I didn't know that about basketball and soccer being this magic potent combination so there must have been something about you that they could see because clearly this has been something that worked for you so tell me how was it um you moved from the united states to australia what did that look like in terms of how you you kind of adjusted must have been a bit of a, an adjustment i would have thought yeah <laughs> nine thousand five hundred miles or something like that away from each other from home but um yeah i mean it's a 24-hour flight to get back home like it's a it's a very long way so if something does happen you have to come to the realization early that you're not going to be able to just you know in the flick of your fingers be able to to be there so um that first six months was was quite tough like you can imagine um no family no friends no circle i guess to for support and things like that um and that's always i think whenever you move somewhere 
is finding your kind of like tribe and your people um, is always one of the hardest things whenever you move cities or, you know, move jobs or whatever it may be in life and, and transition to a new, a new chapter. And that was, that was it for me. Like the first six months, I really struggled. Um, as you can imagine, like you, you don't know who to trust. And all my friends were essentially work friends because that's kind of what I engulfed my life with. And that first six months was quite tough, but I don't know. I try to look at everything glass half full. I'm like, I could be moving to a country where I don't speak the language and they don't keep up with the things that happen in America. And it could be very, you know, a very, very vast difference between, between that and being back home where I felt like Australia, like New Zealand would be the same, you know, like we all speak the same language. Like I can go to a cafe and like order a coffee and not like freak out about not saying it right. Um, and it just seemed like it was somewhat normal, which made me feel comfortable. And then, um essentially after that i kind of had to learn a bit of the australian culture which is um i think their way of doing it is like they make fun of you to say they're friends with you <laughs> at times like, i don't know if it's like that in new zealand but that's a sign of love sometimes here um and that was kind of that was interesting to learn that kind of took a little bit getting used to but um i had some amazing people that kind of reached out and uh people i'm forever grateful for that kind of you know took me in as, as family and you know would ask me to come to family dinners and go out and you know, have dinner with them or have a coffee with them uh, whenever I'm having a rough day or whatever it was. And uh, I think that kind of made me realize early in my life or my experience here in Australia, just how important that inner circle of friends are whenever it comes to support. Um, I really love what you said at the beginning about framing. Framing when you're coming to do something big in your life to be able to say, hey, here are some things that are good. I've come to a country where I can speak the language. It could be harder if I didn't speak the language. Actually, the adjustment here will be easier. And in terms of resilience and taking a big step and change, that's a really important skill is to be able to say, um, I'm probably going to get more out of this than if I didn't take up the opportunity. And what are the things here that make it a little bit easier for me? So I know that's not what we're talking about today, but this is all the same stuff, right? It's about resilience about, you know, sometimes getting out of your comfort zone. So you could have easily gone, what? I go over the other side of the world to play a sport I, I don't know. Um, thanks, but no thanks. You know, I've got, I, I live in, in, in a country where I'm comfortable. I've got a good life. Why would I? And, and for some people that would be a lot. You go, why would I not? But then be able to go, yeah, this does feel uncomfortable. Sometimes the biggest change requires us to go through some discomfort to get to the good stuff. Otherwise, we just never do anything. And often that's when you're highly anxious. Sometimes people find that very difficult. So to be able to go, even if you've got some anxiety to go, but actually, what are my commonalities? My commonalities are language. You know, the idea that even though it's a 24 hour flight, you can go home. It's a lot, but you would be able to go home. So being able to focus on the things that you can control and then reframe it. That's a really important skill. So, and you also learned that Australian and also Kiwi thing where actually a, a bit of banter. Um, <laughs> yes. um, it, it's, it's, um, it's one of the things that sets us a little bit apart. Or oh, you can get a little bit in, in, in England as well, where people will say they kind of tease you. And the more that you're teased, the more that it means they love you. Although, you know, we have to be careful with that because if you don't know, it can feel a bit much. So okay, so you um you ended up with some good friends. You ended up in in uh, um in Melbourne. So tell me from there, what happened? Yeah, we'll, we'll go back and speak. And I think like, and this will kind of come into I think the rest of the conversation we'll have is, um, like I came here and I, I realized I needed to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, and that's probably one of the biggest things I've learned throughout my time here is like, you know, you, you do something new and like, it's, it's like writing a paper, right? The first paragraph is always the hardest paragraph, but once you get through that, you know, the rest kind of just starts to flow and you start going, but if you can get through that first chunk, like then you kind of become almost like scheduled and it becomes a routine. And then that routine is just normal life where I think that was kind of one of the biggest things I learned, you know, coming over here and being in such an uncomfortable you know, situation with, you know, all new stimuluses everywhere, even learning a sport from scratch. And then that kind of became like interesting and fun to be able to to take challenges on, be able to accomplish challenges and be able to, you know, subtly, you know, create little small wins along the way to create a big win. And that was one of the biggest things I think I really was like able to learn about a life skill, you know, like those life skills that kind of really, you know, continue on throughout. Like that was one of the biggest things I learned here. But um, I've gone on an absolute tangent there. Now, sorry, let me go back to your no, question. No, <laughs> no, no, no. I feel like that was very much like in the same space that we'll talk about going out, going forward. No, I, I just wanted to bring it back to what you just said, because this is all the same stuff. When we're talking about movement, we're also talking about being uncomfortable. When we're talking about basically harnessing life, these skills, um, do not they're not just about one thing. And what you said was the little wins. 
being uncomfortable, these are, these are all just brilliant things. Like being uncomfortable with being uncomfortable, being comfortable with uncomfortableness, or being okay to be uncomfortable, very important to grow. And being uncomfortable is necessary when we're going through change. Otherwise, you know, that's the thing about not putting ourselves out there means that you don't grow. And so that's an important thing, but it can feel bad. So you have to go, you know what, this is about actually getting somewhere else. So I've just got to be prepared sometimes to fail. I've got to be prepared to learn stuff and I might not be brilliant because you possibly, I mean, you had to learn a whole new sport. So I'm imagining there was some learning trajectory there and being okay with, you know, failing. I was terrible. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> kick a ball. I look back now, I couldn't even put, boot the ball is what they say. Um, but luckily things have changed since. But yeah, it was a quite steep learning curve. And you had to persevere. You know, the idea, were there moments when you just went, why? Why am I doing this? Mm, I ask that question a lot sometimes, but <laughs> you always come back to the amazing experiences you had and uh, are having, you know, and uh, it's a once in a lifetime thing that I won't be able to do again. So you got to make the best of what's around. Amazing. So I think to even get to the point that you're at, you had to do this kind of almost deep learning. And these skills are things that are translatable in life. Usually. When you're going to excel at anything, you know, being uncomfortable with uncomfortable, but small wins to get to the big wins, because we're never going to get to the big wins without our brains are not designed to think of the future in a year. So to keep us going, we have to go, all right, well, today, I mean, I'm very bad at sports analogies, but, you know, today I'm just going to learn to catch the ball. And yeah. tomorrow I'm going to learn to do this because I can't expect to be over here if I don't do X, Y, and Z. And that's true of any new thing when you're learning it. So we um, human beings aren't wired to imagine or we, we try to imagine when we're good at things, but not the process of getting there. And also we're very bad at predicting the future. Um, it's why we're very bad at risk analysis, you know, to go, well, it's risky, but I don't really feel like it's risky because I feel okay right now. Um, you know, it's it's why we still binge alcohol. It's all of those things. You go, yeah, which I'll be fine. And then, you know, the consequence, because our brains are very bad at kind of predicting a future. So actually taking it down to small goals, really important mm -hmm. to get to that big win. So, so it's been 10 years. So tell me about those 10 years and also the whole thing about exercise for you, movement, success, um, mental health. Tell me about you generally, your philosophy, because it feels like, um, to have it, your own podcast, there's some stuff that you really, really have to say. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, everyone's got a podcast now, right? Um, but no, it's, I think like those early days and, uh, you know, like everyone sits there and goes, okay, like you can say, look, I want to play 100 games, 200 games. I want to, you know, play the first AFL game. It's like, I remember my coach, one of the first things when we got here, like I couldn't do the very, very basics of the sport. And I'd never seen a football. I'd never seen a field like I had no idea what I was doing like I was in total ignorance and we had to like you said break it down like the first thing we did was watch the film he explained the basics of rules and what you can and can't do what you know how the sport works which by the sounds of this chat some people don't really know what the sport is so like it's a it's a somewhat um unique sport only in Australia really um but it was one of those things like you had to break it down and then you know once we understood the sport and like understood the uh you know the rules and stuff like that and it was like okay let's teach you the basics of kind of what you would teach like a six-year-old kid that's learning the sport also and it was they call it oz kick here which like the coach essentially went to me and says look we're going to teach you how to kick we're going to teach you how to like handball which is like how you move the ball around um and it was it was very bare bones basics you know and then from that you build on you build on it where we never said straight from the beginning said like 100 goals like 100 games that's where you're going to play or 100 goals you're going to kick it was like no, tomorrow we're going to work on this. We're going to try to, you know, be able to get you to do this by tomorrow, which to someone who's played the game before would be like, that's okay. That's simple. Like that's easy. That comes natural. But for a person that never played the sport, it was, it was a big accomplishment kind of thing, you know? And so we, we kind of broke it down into smaller, smaller bits and pieces, never looked too far ahead and knew that if we were able to accomplish these things along the way, then that stuff would take care of itself. And that would eventuate from the successes of that, of the the smaller bits that we kind of worked up to. And um, it was it was tough because you can imagine like I'm I'm a very like I want I want it now kind of person, you know, like I want I want to I want success now and I want to do this now. And this was something that I had to take years and years of, you know, being able to meticulously learn all these different things to add up to me being able to play an AFL game, like much less. You know, we're playing in front of we're the we're the biggest uh, AFL team in Australia, and we're playing in front of crowds of like eighty thousand every week. So, 
a little bit of pressure for a guy who's never heard of the sport to walk in front of 80,000 people and try to perform whenever you don't really know what's going on. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a crazy experience. Like mental health, talk about that. Like that was up, that was down. That was depending on the day. It was kind of crazy. And like, I've had breakdowns and everything else throughout my career. And, um, it's, it's part of it. Like now looking back, I'm, I'm playing in my ninth year now, um, 10 years in Australia. And I look back and I'm like, you know, like I've grown so much as a human being able to handle, the ups and downs that come with sport. Like there's the every single day or every single week as a coach, you have to either tell someone that they're living out their life goal or they're taking a step back in their life goal, which means you might've been dropped from the team or you're playing in the team. Um, and it's tough. It's tough from that side. And you, you start to look at those things of other people and, you know, the, the hardness that it would have to be to tell someone that and have that conversation that's uncomfortable. Um, and the respect you gain for the people on the other side, I guess, of those conversations. But and um, yeah, the mental health side of things is in sports really tough because you have the pressure of everyone else. Like oh, you, you walk down the street and people ask you about the game and, you know, if you're playing or not and everything else, it's like you, you sometimes feel as though you're in a cage, you can't escape. Uh, but it's it's kind of all part of it is growing as a human being and being able to, you know, be able to handle, I guess, the adversity that comes with it. And uh, that's something I've, I've definitely learned. I think it's hardened me, quote unquote, is what a lot of people like to say. And as a human to be able to handle feedback and be able to, to handle other people knowing, I guess, about your personal life and your professional life and everything else that comes with it. But um, yeah, it's, it's been a, a heck of a roller coaster. And I think um, I've had some amazing coaches who the very first coach I ever had is now my head coach, which is kind of unique. So he's kind of come full circle. He's come to, he went to another team and now he's come back to be our head coach and I've played for the same team my whole career. So it's now the guy who essentially taught me how to play AFL is now my head coach of the AFL team. So uh, it's an amazing kind of relationship between us to be able to kind of give back to him what he was um, giving to me in those early days of his time and effort and everything else to try to help me grow as a person, as a footballer. Now to try to help him as a head coach of our club to have success is kind of like an amazing life experience for me to try to give back to him in some sort of way, uh, which has been pretty amazing. So you have some, um, I, I think, some natural things that are protective. One is that giving back narrative. Well, the idea that you're giving back is actually really helpful when you are um, in peak performance, high performance sports or in life generally. Giving back to someone is a good framing because what you're talking about is high pressure. You're saying, um, you know, I'm recognizable. We play in front of a lot of people. So if I have a bad game, everyone gets to see that. And I'm probably a critic of myself, but there'll be other people who tell me how to play and human beings don't love that. We don't love that feedback because sometimes the feedback is actually not really their business, but everyone's a coach, right? Everyone knows when you're a fan of sport, everyone, uh, they're an expert. And on top of that being publicly recognizable and also in a sport, you know, there is a life cycle for sports star because it's not forever. And so therefore you're living knowing that actually at some point you're going to transition to into something else. And we know with young sports people, it's, it's tough when that's been your entire life. So what do you do to protect yourself or what are you doing to top up? What do you do to make sure that you're okay? Oh, so there's a lot of different things. Um, I do do the podcast, like so the podcast, the radio stuff, that's kind of future. Um, so I always kind of feel as though, um, like you said, like this career, unfortunately, does not last forever. <laughs> I'm very well aware of that. So um, for myself, putting myself into media experiences, that's what I want to do post career. So I think the importance of, uh, you know, having your overall life goals of what you want to do and uh, what you might want to transition to into the future, you know, you have your one, five, 10 year goal or whatever it may be. Um, my five year goal, I know in five years, the chances are I'm probably not going to be an athlete anymore. So I've started to make those steps now to see if I can maybe get into a career in an industry in the radio or the media um, and making those commitments now to hopefully have the experience and a bit of the, um, you know, the resume to be able to go into that, you know, straight after football. So that's kind of where that side of things come. That's, and that's a bit of a, a you know, I don't know. It's it's getting away from football, but also you talk about football on that obviously quite a bit. But um, another thing I do, I play golf. I love to just go for a walk and uh, play golf. Like it's they say, this is someone told me this recently was um, women are okay with asking each other to go for a walk and have a chat about life, right? Men go play golf to do that. So essentially, we go for a walk. 
we talk about life and we hit a ball in between. Um, and that's kind of what I've come to realize is like, yes, the act of going to play golf is great, but I think it's more of like the community feel of doing something together with someone else, sharing stories from the week, whoever it may be. Um, and doing stuff that doesn't feel like I'm, well, let's say like, you're exercising, right? You might walk 5Ks, whatever it is, on a golf course or um, whatever it may be, but you don't feel like that because you're interacting with someone the whole time. And you feel as though you're just kind of having a nice little chat with someone else and a, a walk around town. Um, if I do that, I do, I've got a bike behind me. I like to go biking, stuff like that. Obviously, very active lifestyle. Um, I enjoy going to the movies, but the whole, um, somewhat of a detox away from sport is so important for my mental health. I know. I need to get away from it whenever things may be rough or tough, wherever it may be, and try to involve more of my personal life that I know brings me happiness. We talk about at our club, filling our cup is what I kind of one of our big mottos, right? So you, you can either say the cup's half full or half empty, and we try to always keep it half full. So uh, at least half full, sorry. And um, that's kind of one of those things, like on our off days, we always say, go fill your cup, like go fill your cup with happiness, go fill your cup with your family, go fill your cup with something that makes you feel good. And um, those are some of the things that I kind of do whenever I have a day off, you know, I might have some free time to go for a walk or listen to a podcast or do something that kind of brings happiness back to my life. Uh, whenever you have the stresses of work or, you know, performance or whatever it may be, that's something I'll look at as, as a high importance whenever it comes to work-life balance, if that makes sense. And also what's good about filling your cup is that allows you to keep peak performance because it's actually, mm-hmm. you can't, if you let that cup deplete you haven't got social relationships that you're not spending time just being for a bit. And that might be just watching a movie. We know that in the end, we're not machines, human beings. We need all of those things. So I love that that's one of the philosophies that is part of the club that you're in. Filling your cup is important for all of us. And also what you raised, and I guess a lot of what we are meant to be talking about today is that kind of moving for your mind. So you're an elite athlete. So your movement is your job, but also you're moving and chatting, which is a very good thing. I think you're right. For men generally, having something to do while you're talking helps. Um not to be reductive about it. You know, there are some men that are very good at chatting, but that idea yeah. of taking a golf ball and still moving um, and chatting and doing something, fishing is another one. Fishing to me is yeah. one of the most mindful things that you can do. And I know a lot of men that I love, that's their mindful time, their time where they're actually just sitting by the water and being, finding out what your thing is that helps you top up. But getting movement into your day in a way that allows you to be social is one of the things that can be really helpful when movement isn't something that you do generally, because most of us are not athletes. It is not our job to move. And so even hearing that you, who has movement in your day all the time, actually does some stuff that's recreational is really helpful to hear, because that's one of the keys here. When we talk about moving for your mind, we know that human beings are designed to move. Um, Mason, I was talking to you at the beginning of um, our chat about the whole thing about why human beings stop loving movement. And one of the mm-hmm. things research shows that little kids, particularly um, often little boys, are often in trouble when they're at school as five-year-olds because they squirm in their feet on the, in their seat because we're actually wired to, to move and yet we're taught when we go to school to stop moving and often those are the kids that get in trouble the ones that actually have movement we're all wired to move that's how we walk and crawl we'd never do those things if our brains were not telling us we should be moving were you one of those kids that was in trouble for moving when you were at school <laughs> Yes, very much so. I'm sitting here and like I've got like restless legs. Like my legs are always kind of like in movement. I don't know if anyone else out there is like that. But even I'm on a meeting, there's some part of me that's like moving in the background. Like I just I feel like me, I'm a like in PE and stuff. I think I think we call it PE back home. I want to say they call it back PE here. But um yeah, I was one of those kids that could you know, you'd sit cross legged and then you sit straight and then you sit cross legged again, you're always moving. And the teacher's always looking at you saying, like, can you just can you just calm down? You know, like <laughs> always had to be active but it is true like you know you grew up and you know it's it's easier to you know i guess discipline people that are all in the same and quiet and you know just staying still and yeah you know, as as human beings like you said like we're not we're not meant to stay still you know like we do we do spend nowadays how much time we spend in front of a computer how much time we spend at a desk and and um you have to really kind of make that commitment to get out and move or go to lunch or go for a walk or whatever it is where and um, whenever you're actually working, it's not really ne- a necessity of the work you're doing, if that makes sense. So it's uh, it's a change in the human, I guess, um, you know, the human day that we're used to now. And it's obviously over the last five years completely kind of gone one side. We're all a lot, a lot of people are working from home. And, and if you don't leave your house, you know, you've got that feeling of like, oh, my gosh, I need to get out of here. Like, I need to go outside and do something. 
Um, and it's probably something we're dealing with more and more every single day. Yeah. And so that psychological thing around if you've been told when you were young to to stop moving or then I think we talked about, you know, for some people who are naturally athletic, PE is a great thing. You know, PE is like you can go out there and and for some people who are not naturally athletic, the idea of that being a poor experience or something that you started to dread. And I can remember there was a time in my life, maybe at high school, where PE was something that you dreaded. And I think it was mainly mainly the sports that we were choosing. I I can't remember it being a primary school issue. But I think that there's some research to show that for some people, that adverse experience is something that you kind of take on. And so movement or exercise is something that you associate with, you know, humiliation or um, not being as good as because human beings don't always love to do things that they're not good at. And so um, and put in an environment like that for some people that that can be the reason that we go, oh, exercise. When actually, when you think about it, we are meant to exercise. Exercise should be good for us. And so combining it with some things that you like doing, like going out with a mate is an important one. If exercise is something that you find tricky and that social thing about sport, that's why sport is such a wonderful thing. And I, I wanted to talk about that because I'm imagining it's also um, a great part of the camaraderie within a team is really helpful. Yeah. I, I don't know how tennis players and golf players do it, to be honest. Um, if you didn't have, you know, someone else there to, like I think about one of our first came there, right? Like I've got people that were going to be hall of famers that was playing alongside and I'm a guy that doesn't even know how to kick a football. Like it was just literally off at its opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, but you know, you had something to aspire to be, you know, you had something that you could kind of lift yourself up to try to get to their level kind of thing. And uh, consistently seeing that kind of made you want to be better. It made you want to try to get to the level they're at. So I think, you know, whenever it comes to, you know, working out or whenever it comes to just going and being active, like doing it with someone else is what keeps you on path, like on, on this path, you know, right. Of, of making sure you do it in a consistent manner and making sure you're, you know, doing it with someone else keeps you accountable. Um, and it, it's so hard. Like one of the hardest things I tell people all the time, one of the hardest things is off season because I go back home or people go and travel and things like that. And you don't have three or four other guys that want to do that, do the same program with you, you know, that you can show up, you put cones down, you do your sprints back and forth. I mean, like going and sprinting 30, 40 meters for an hour, like, you know, back and forth is the most monotonous, boring thing you could possibly think of. Like, and not having people there to do it with and kind of have a laugh with or talking between sets, whatever it is, uh, makes it that much harder. Where even taking that back to, you know, like just going out for a walk, like there's things like that, that, you know, it takes your mind away from maybe uh, the uneasiness or, you know, the commitment of how to do it. You go, okay, well, that's just part of the day, you know, like they're going to do it. I'll jump on with them. We'll have a great time. Or we'll go and chat about X, Y, Z, you know, um, I think making that commitment with other people just makes the experience of going and moving, um, whether it be, you know, just going, like I said, going for a walk or going for a high intensity workout, whatever it might be, just so much more enjoyable. And then it also, like I said, keeps you accountable in that sense that you don't want to say, I mean, I feel like we've all been this route. Right? Like, let's say you're going for a walk. You don't want to be the person that backs out. You don't want to be the person that commits to something and then uncommits to something, right? I feel like that's natural, you know, human uh, nature, but that kind of keeps you accountable to say like, no, no, like I've committed to this goal, you know, to, to let's say go for a walk at least two or three times a week. And like, if I can have five different people, I want to go on a walk with this week and, you know, we can maybe have a group of three, group two, whatever it is. Um, and they're all on that same commitment. Like we're all going to create, uh, sorry, end up being able to accomplish this goal together, which just makes us all feel better. So I think whenever you do it with other people, it holds you to account and also makes you enjoy the experience, experience way more. Yeah, that is definitely the secret for those slugs like me who are not very easily able to talk myself out of exercise. But if I know that I'm meeting on a Sunday, people who know me know this, on a Sunday I will meet a girlfriend and we walk and it's in my diary and I never feel like I'm walking. We walk quite a long way because we're talking and I would never let them down. And Also, I really love it. And I think for many of us, making exercise enjoyable is a really important thing. And one of the things that we check at Groove, we ask people how much exercise they've done or how regularly they've exercised over the last seven days. And then we ask them and people will say they've been regular exercises. And then we ask if they've enjoyed it, you know, you know, how much exercise have you enjoyed? And there's always a disconnect between the exercise that I've done and the exercise that I've enjoyed. And sometimes there's quite a disconnect. And so it's really hard to keep up doing something that it's not bringing you enjoyment unless you're somebody who in and of itself is like, you know, I'm doing this because it's giving me something else. But we should be doing movement that we enjoy as well. And from the research for our mood, it doesn't have to be very much. As much as kind of the five minutes of walking every day impacts mood. 
And um, what's good about small amounts of exercise, if you've been out of condition, is that we're more likely to keep it up because the secret of keeping it up is accountability is a good one, doing it with other people. And the other is not boom and bust. You know, if you go, right, I'm going to exercise, I haven't done it for a while, and now I'm an hour and a half out there and tomorrow I just feel shocking. Actually, the research now is that little and often, if you are right now kind of out of the loop of exercise, is important. And try and make it something that you that you like. Um, DIY, being outside in the garden, all of those things, and um, what we call non-exercise, exercise counts. Getting up after dinner, really important after you've eaten to move, getting up out of dinner uh, and, and loading the dishwasher. Now you can go, this is great because this is good for my body. Um, there are ways to integrate it in, into your life. And so, um, Mason, where you are right now, you've started a podcast. Tell me about what the podcast is. Uh, the podcast is uh, it covers kind of IFL, and we have some celebrities that come on and uh, talk about their connection to it and their life and everything else. So we've uh, we've had some pretty amazing people. Matt Preston's a bit of a, a cook. I don't know if many people know who Matt Preston is uh, absolute legend, uh, one of the nicest humans. Uh, I baked him a carrot cake. I don't think he was too impressed with it, but uh, it's a CA yeah, best of us. So it's kind of tough. But um, no, we've had people like that, uh, comedians, Peter Hellier, um, surfers. We had Mick Fanning on. Uh, we've had a lot of different people from different backgrounds. Uh, and then we talk about what's happening in the football world every single week. But uh, going back to kind of what you were saying about movement and enjoyment with it, like one thing uh, I kind of try to bring my life into uh, and what some of the things that I do maybe to try to help someone else out, right? So like we all watch Netflix or we watch TV or whatever it may be, right? Um, I have a mat in front of my TV. And for me, it's like anytime if I watch Netflix, I have to make a commitment to do something, you know, physical on that mat. But like usually it's stretching or usually it's putting a spiky ball on like, you know, doing some kind of recovery or putting recovery boots on or whatever it might be that I can do while also watching something that I enjoy. So whether it be going for a walk and listening to your favorite podcast, so then you have in your mind, you go, okay, I want to listen to this podcast or I want to listen to this, you know, Spotify playlist or whatever it is. And then in the back of your mind, you're going, oh, I should go for a walk. It's like these two are connected. These two, you know, are intertwined in the sense that I get happiness from, you know, listening to that or watching Netflix or whatever it is, but I also am able to do something else that is good for my body at the same time. So that's kind of one way I look at things and uh, you need to make sure that you're doing it and you're, you're happy with doing those two together, obviously. Uh, but I feel like that's one thing that can, I guess, get you subconsciously active and moving whenever it's something that's already scheduled into your day that you probably do already. Uh, a lot of us, you know, are on social media or whatever it is and, and going through that. And it's like, if you commit, say every hour you're on social media, you have to go out and walk for 30 minutes, you know, and it's like this kind of contract with yourself to say, if you're going to get, you know, this enjoyment from this, then you're going to go and make sure you do something else for your body because uh, it's such an important thing. So that's that's maybe like a little, I don't know, a little tidbit. Maybe people out there can kind of do. I, I keep my little yoga mat literally right next to my TV. So anytime I turn it on, I see that and it's a trigger for me of like, you've got to go and do some stretching or something. Um, and that kind of gets me, I guess, going in a sense for my body to be able to say, okay, like you can do two things at once and be able to concentrate and do something that's actually good for you. I love it. I have done it. I have my yoga mat, but my husband keeps putting it away. And you're right. One of the things having that yoga mat, because you're a real tidy person, engineer, going, well, what, what's this here? It's like, well, yeah. it's you remind me. He goes, well, when was the last time that you did it? I was like, I know, well, I can't now because it's gone. Um, yeah, it's the connection is a really good one because often um, we are creatures of habit and making yeah. something, building it into that habit, habitual stuff. And taking the opportunities where they are and stretching in front of a television program is awesome. Um, and I really take pride in the fact that I can move my leg and then the people behind me can't see the TV. So, ha, ha, <laughs> it be down here for me. Um, and, and so really it's about building it into your day in a way that makes sense. And what I, you also said, which I thought was really fascinating was the idea of if I'm going to be exercising my mind or having a bit of entertainment, maybe I say that's great because I've been sitting and I've been watching TikTok for a bit, but actually what I'm going to do is for my, every 10 minutes I do this, I'll do 10 minutes of some sort of exercise, which might be go for a walk, might be un unload the dishwasher, do something in the house because that's, that all counts. And that makes us moving and that makes movement basically integrated into the day. Cause some of the research shows us now that even if we do massive exercise at the beginning and the end of the day, if we're sitting constantly, it's actually causing us harm because we're not designed to be on our bottoms for hours at a time. So having those little pieces in the day where you're saying, well, I've been 10 minutes here or half an hour or an hour um, at work, it's getting up and stretching, um, walking to get some water is a good one because often when we're in a moment, we're focused, 
But actually what we're doing is we may be sitting at two or three hours at a time, and that's just not what we're, we're designed to do. But often people say to me, but I go to, I exercise at the end of the day, which is amazing. Do not stop. That's incredible. But it's actually getting the little incremental bits into your day where I'm imagining, Mason, your life is much more about getting that exercise into the day. But when you're going home and you're off season, yeah, that's a really important one to, to make sure that you are keeping up with it. And do you notice the kind of mental health benefit from exercising regularly? Do you notice when you're stopping to get out of it, particularly you where you live at such a high level? Yeah, I think the biggest like the biggest time I notice that is if we go through an injury, right? So let's say like I've had uh, entirely too many injuries. I've had five or, five or six surgeries on my eyes. I've done um, ankles, knees, shoulders, the whole thing you can imagine. And whenever something's taken away from you, like obviously we work out every single day pretty much. So whenever that's fully taken away from you, and I, I mean, I even earlier in this year, I can, I guess I speak to an experience. I had a, um, a lacerated spleen. I was internally bleeding, had to get surgery, this whole thing. And I essentially was on no workout duties for like eight weeks in the middle of season. So I would go into the office and this is like your purpose at the office, right? This is the, like, this is why you, this is why you're there to work out. And I wasn't able to So um, I realized after about maybe 24 hours or like two days or whatever it was, I was like, my mood is just going downhill. I need to do something to like, and usually I'm, I'm going a high intensity workout, but like I would just go out for a walk and like, you know, I'll just continue walk. I put some headphones on. I'll just go for a walk and just kind of get lost in, you know, the activity of doing that. And that was about as much as I could do. But I feel like in those moments, whenever you're injured and you have that kind of ability taken away from you, you kind of come to the realization of just how important it is to actually work out and to be able to, you know, get a sweat on or go for a walk or just getting out and moving. Um, at one point, I had my eye surgery done. That was two weeks bed rest, 45 minutes of every hour. I had to spin on my back. And I could go up and go to the toilet and I had to go back to bed essentially for two weeks straight. So um, that was quite intense. And you come to the realization of just uh, how fortunate we are just to be able to, to move in general. Like, um, and whenever it's taken away from you, like I said, it's, it becomes so front of mind. That you're like, oh my gosh, I, I need to do this every single day. Like I want to do this every single day because I know there is benefits from it. Um, and I've kind of got like a subconscious, um, I guess, like meter in my head of, you know, like how much I've probably worked out and kind of how that affiliates with my mood. And if my mood kind of goes to a certain point, I know I just need to go out and get outside and go for a walk. And a lot of times if I come back, you know, you let's say something's happening in your life and it's quite upsetting or whatever it may be, I'll go and walk it out. I'll go for a walk and I'll just kind of think about it. It gives me 30 minutes to an hour, whatever it is, um, just to be able to soak in all the different details that came with this that's made me upset and why I'm upset and everything else. And you kind of, come to a realization after you kind of take a breath from the whole situation here. Okay. This is how I want to handle it. This is what I need to do going forward. And that walk a lot of times just takes my mind away from it. You're doing something active, your endorphins are going, you become happier, you become more clear headed to make a better decision. If that makes sense. Oh, it makes sense from a science point of view. The idea of um, distraction from the issue that's causing you either pain or um, mental kind of load is really important. We know it, from a working situation, doing anything sometimes in a day when you've been focused or you're in a place, being able to then get out of it to distract your mind is good for performance. And it's particularly good if you're going through some sort of emotional upheaval or you're going in a painful place, you're, you're going through pain. And then beyond that, saying, all right, for me, that distraction, I, I get outside and getting outside is incredibly good for well-being. It's um, vitamin D from the sun. It's also, you know, if you see some greenery, we know the amygdala stands down and you're moving your body in a way that we're designed to do, which is walking. We are actually meant to be on our feet and, and moving. So having that recognition, I think, is important. That's really hard sometimes. I can think about times in my life where it's been a bit tough and I go to the gym and I'm like, oh, this was what I was missing. The exercise was the thing, but I never remembered that it was the exercise. Because when you're in that place, sometimes the things that help us, we don't remember. Even though we've made those associations again and again and again, we have to continue to make those associations. And sometimes when you are feeling overwhelmed or you are um, you can't do the, the extreme sport, but we could probably move the body, it's when you're doing it, you go, oh, that's right. There's something which is reminding me I, I'm going to do some exercise just after this because I'm thinking, I think I have been quite sedentary after the last little while, very good at talking about this stuff. But sometimes literally walking the talk is harder because you can talk yourself out of it very easily. And then when you push yourself a little bit, you're going, oh, yeah, that's right. And I think many of us 
recognize that in ourselves. So it's kind of making those associations for us and why movement can be so good. It's not just about the movement. It's about the distraction. Sometimes it's about taking ourselves away from the place where the stress is, just walking out the front door. If you're a parent with young children, sometimes being able to just get out the front door and go for a walk, it's about getting away from people being on you all the time. There's a lot of good to be around this idea of moving in the day. And if we can shift attitudes around exercise, which I think in the West, sometimes for many people, it's like, oh, exercise. And I am one of those people. It's going, actually, no, this is about moving in a way that works for you, that you enjoy. And let's change the narrative around that and keep it. So someone like you, who's an elite athlete, also has movements in other ways, which I think is an awesome thing. So where, what have we got coming up on your schedule, Mason? You've got some games coming up. Tell me, what, what are you yeah. looking at right now? Uh, we've got our last game of the season, of regular seasons on uh, Friday this week. So, And then uh, we've qualified for finals. If we won that game, we finished top of the, uh, top of the table. So um, it would be pretty exciting to win that. And when, uh, I guess they call it like the minor premiership here. I'm still kind of confused by the wording sometimes. But um, And then we go to finals, which is playoffs um and hopefully you know over the month of september we can do something special so the uh the grand final the last game of the season is essentially the last weekend of september um so some of the uh the big games of the year and what we all kind of you know do all this work throughout the 24 25 weeks comes down to this next four week period to try to make the most of it so it's um it's an exciting time it's kind of what we play is uh for this time of year so it's uh one of those things now where you really kind of hone in and focus in on, I guess, what the team's trying to do and uh, trying to make the most of the opportunity, like I said, and, and hopefully win the whole thing. Oh, well, that is incredibly exciting. So what were the dates? Of the what, When when are we talking? The last weekend of September is the grand final. And then um, we've got our last game of the regular season this weekend. Uh, then we have a week off. And then the next weekend is essentially whenever finals start. So it's... Um, it's all coming around the same time, I think, like, because uh, obviously some people here from uh, New Zealand um, and uh, like Sydney and everything else, like NRL is about the same time. So I think they're about to go into finals too. So sport in Australia is uh, around this time of year is pretty exciting and uh, it's going to be pretty incredible just to, to be around it all. And uh, the, the city starts getting a buzz and everything else and summer starts coming around and everyone gets really excited. And um, it's just a good feeling. It's a good feeling. We finally, the sun's not out today. I think someone put it in the chat that the, the sun's out in Knockland today, but Sun's never out in Melbourne, I feel like, but it is getting there. We had like an 18 degree day the other day, so it was a big deal. <laughs> um, and hopefully it just continues in that direction. The thing about Melbourne is, you know, the sun will come out. It, it does. Eventually. Yeah, eventually. eventually. No, I know. I know. It, it has extremes and you go one day to the next. You're not absolutely sure. Um, so Mason, at a very busy time in your life, you've given the gift of time to us and we really appreciate it. We had a, a lot of people on this call and people were not leaving. So we know that they were interested in what you had to say. So thank you so much for your time and, um, being so relatable and human and was like so much good stuff in there about kind of framing how you see the world filling your cup, making sure that you looked for those small silver linings, small goals to keep you going, to keep you motivated, making sure that actually it's not just movement in your in your day for work, but actually movement to maintain your social life, to make sure that you are having those conversations with your buddies um, and golf is a way to do that. Um, making sure that you are, you know, a full person. And that's what's wonderful about you. The idea that you've got some plans for, you know, the future, which is important for all of us. And you've got things that you're looking forward to. So this was a really amazing session. Thank you so, so much. Um, thank you to our wonderful audience for staying with us and being captivated by this incredible conversation. Mason, we'll all, we, we should all go into the Mason Cox show and download it on a podcast. Is that where we can find it? All good podcasts. <laughs> find your podcasts i think the actual thing is you can find it anywhere you find your podcast uh something along those lines it's on every platform um thank you for promoting that by the way you can learn more about what afl is and, and some of the uh the funny haircuts and stuff like that we go through it all we go, <laughs> we're more of an entertainment podcast than say than sport but uh no it's great fun and uh, thanks so much for having me on i really appreciate it and hopefully people can take something out of this to, to apply in their own life um, and like I said, just be able to create those small goals that create something, a, a bigger goal and accomplishment you can have in the future. So a massive, massive thank you for having me on. It's been so enjoyable to share my experiences.